So um, thank you, comrades. This is a um, bit weird for me this hour being midnight. I'm a construction worker, so my life is usually the other way around where I wake up at like 4 or 5 a.m. Um, so comrades, this discussion is less so about the shape of the eventual recovery and more so about recognizing all the ways in which the capitalist economy is branching in two directions. We want to concentrate here on the bifurcation or the K-shaped character between rich and poor countries, between the classes within nations, and also within the working class itself. So how pre-existing economic gaps have been or are likely to widen. Uh, Trotsky distilled the essence of dialectical materialism as a method of looking at the world in an all-sided way. The struggle for, of Marxism is to see uh, the world in their living, in uh, see things in their living, moving depth and color, to unearth the contradictory tensions below the surface as they increase and explode. In the past 70 years, almost all global economic recoveries have been U-shaped, some longer, some shorter, and, so, or, and some deeper. The only V-shaped recovery in modern US history was in 1948 at the outbreak of the post-war economic upswing. That boom was relatively one-sided based on an expansion of manufacturing in Western Europe and the US and Japan, accelerated by the dominance of the dollar. Um, that, uh, it, it was not uh, K-shaped in its broad positive impact, at least for the imperialist nations. The depth of the crisis has forced OEC countries to plow an equivalent of 33% on average of their GDPs into, this, into stimulus. The hope for Europe's $750 billion stimulus and the US's multi-trillion dollar stimulus is that there will be a recovery in the second half of 2021. A rapid business-driven relaxation of pandemic restrictions will likely to uh, continue to ha handicap such perspectives. Past neo neoliberal policies have damaged key sectors of the state apparatus, which has undermined the possibility of efficient tracking and tracing uh, and testing, and now uh, vaccine and vaccine administration and distribution. So the rise of vaccine nationalism and vaccine imperialism if you like, will tend to also bifurcate outcomes across the planet. The nations that are home to 12% of the world's population have cornered 74% of the world's vaccine doses. The meteoric impact of the pandemic has itself felt like the shock of a war. Many pre-existing economic processes have been cut across others accelerated or accentuated by the pandemic's blunt force. The initial economic impact through the stay at home orders halted most economic activity. And this produced a very different experience for, for instance, the tech worker working at home in Berlin from say a lockdown lunch vendor in the shadow economy in Manila. The untaxed, unregulated underground economy accounts for up to 50% of the ex-colonial world's employment and about 22% of world GDP. The majority of the world's population do not have protections against unemployment. Life expectancy in the US has gone down for almost uh, one year for white people, two years for black people, and three to four years for Latinx people. The virus has disproportionately hurt the elderly, the poor and racial minorities. And if we factor in the economic fallout, then we can add women and young people to that list. So the big three uh, imperialist regions, the US, Europe and China have each fared differently each with their own internal variations, such as the accelerated decline of the UK. The real economic power and prestige of nations has been reshuffled a little 
relative to how they navigated the pandemic. The 2008 crisis was primarily a North Atlantic recession triggered by the bursting US uh, um, real estate bubble. While the pandemic depression has hit almost every country equally, outcomes have been quite different. China has many foundational economic uh, weak points. It's massive debt and its difficulties rapidly shifting towards developing their own domestic market. Uh, it saw in 2020 the weakest growth in 44 years. However, China reported only one COVID death in the last half of 2020, which is stunning if you live in the US or uh, Britain or uh, uh, Belgium or other countries uh, hard hit and has now emerged uh, uh, stronger globally. And China has become the exporter of last resort in the world. It exported over 200 billion masks and 200,000 ventilators during the last year. The cost of a shipping container from China to Europe has risen from $2,000 per container to $10,000 in the last nine weeks because no one wants to pay to send an empty container back to Europe uh, or rather back to China from Europe. So this may also be a small sign of the long-term trend of weakened growth in uh, global trade and the turn towards more regional trading blocks. Europe, Europe and the US will continue to gradually lose more world market share to China. A sign of China still struggling for, for first world status is that Chinese bonds are forced to continue to have a higher yield than European and US bonds. Yet the renminbi, renminbi uh, yuan has also strengthened, rising by 8% against the dollar in the last period, despite attempts by Russia and China, the dollar is not likely to be replaced by the euro or the yuan soon. Of the world's stock markets, the FTSE fared worse, uh, with Shanghai, Dow and Nikkei indexes coming out best. Uh, finance capital is fleeing London and is more likely to land in Singapore than it is in Frankfurt. <clears throat> If Biden's stimulus passes, which isn't a foregone conclusion, the US will have spent $5 trillion supporting its markets. The size, prestige, and hegemony of the US continues to allow it to force its rivals to pay for the crisis. In the last 50 years, as a percentage of GDP, US debt has doubled, while federal investment has declined by fivefold. It was massive state spending that built the railroads, the freeways and the internet. Such spending seems absent for the development of 5G or massive green infrastructure. And the US assets are more financialized now than, it's, uh, than ever before and, the, and then uh, its own rivals. Levels of debt and stability of currencies will be key factors in how the ex-colonial worlds are able to uh, deal with this pandemic. Brazil, Russia and South Africa have each had dramatic currency declines, making it more expensive to borrow. The gap between the imperialist nations and the weak and its weak rivals will tend to widen in the period ahead. And the region with the worst uh, 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 past, or rather, the region emerging worst this past year has been Latin America, uh, with the worst GDP um, debt to GDP ratio in the world coming into the pandemic. It now has, with 8% of the world's population, 25% roughly of global COVID deaths. Peru, as an example, had a 72% decline in GDP during its second quarter lockdown which is one of the highest ever recorded in world history. In all contexts, the distance between rich countries and poor countries has widened dramatically. Within individual nations, the rise in inequality that slowed a little bit after 2016 has rapidly accelerated in the last year. The wealth, growth 
according to Credit Suisse, was permanently damaged, quote unquote, by the last financial crisis. The 2008 recession eradicated wealth gains everywhere globally, except for India and China. Wealth growth after 2008 has halved in most OECD countries in the last years. At the top of society, the annual growth in the number of new millionaires is about 10% on average in the recent years in the US and about 20% on average in China. The US with 4% of the world's population now is home to 39% of the world's millionaires. There's 20 million millionaires in the US. And much of that wealth, of course, is based on the bubble in house prices. The big imperialist nations continue to dwarf the rest of the globe. However, the crisis has resulted in the big monopolies increasingly swallowing up their rivals. In 2020, the value of European banks, uh, bank mergers, grew by 400% over 2019. 19. This is symptomatic of the general widening of the scissor blades of monopoly capitalism during this period. Big business generally grew bigger and small businesses were more often crushed by shrinking markets, by their pre-existing debt, by high rent <coughs> and by the low price of big businesses products. Big business have, of course, more collateral than small business and more personal connections to the big banks. One banker in the Financial Times described lending as a cash system of credit that favors the big rather than the best. Half of all medium and small businesses in Europe are facing bankruptcy in the next year. Some small retail is, are unlikely to fully recover uh, the massive raiding party that Amazon uh, uh, um, uh, led this year. Big retail, the Carrefours, the Walmarts have dramatically increased their market shares and profits. And generally speaking, the big have got bigger and the small got crushed. Big business had the political infrastructure in place to protect its wealth and standing, while politicians, of course, cried crocodile tears for the decline of small businesses. In 2008, the recession almost uh, hit almost every industrial sector uniformly uh, with job losses, with banking and construction hit worse and healthcare sector hit least. The wealth of the 1% fell in almost every single country during that last uh, financial crisis. This has not been the shape of the 2020 recession. In terms of economic sectors, there was a deep bifurcation of winners and losers. The big losers were primarily small retail and hospitality. As of December, 110,000 restaurants in the US have uh, permanently closed. And the Paris-based Sofitel EB hotel chain has furloughed most of their 310,000 employees. And ridiculously, American Airlines continues to operate despite losing $30 million a day, every day for the last quarter. The airlines are of course highly dependent on business travel, which could now permanently be cut in half due to Zoom <laughs> in part. The big winners were logistics, information technology, communications, and food and drug retail and they won very big. The richest 100 billionaires increased their wealth by nearly $1 trillion. And Apple are now, we just reported last week in the Financial Times, the first private company to make $100 billion profits in one quarter. So for the working class globally, the painful impact of the pandemic depended primarily on where you were in March, 2020. Those hardest hits were in those so were in the so-called emerging nations, those nations without national health systems, uh, also, and those uh, uh, who were impoverished in advanced capitalist countries. 
If you're already indebted and struggled to pay rent, you are more likely to be hungry in 2020. Even in the world's richest nation, some 50 million people are now dependent on food banks. World food production has been affected by rising temperatures and by some initial COVID logistical problems. 2020 tied 2016 so far in terms of the numbers, in terms of uh, a record high uh, for being uh, either the first or second hottest year in, um, on record. Cereal prices rose 16% in 2020, helping to double the world's hungry population to, depends on whose figures you take, but to two, 700 million uh, this year. The likelihood of riots and uprisings around food shortages are inevitable in the period ahead. We shouldn't forget that it was high grain prices that started the Syrian uprising in 2011. Credit to emerging nations will continue to be about creating infrastructure to benefit imperialist extraction of raw materials, as it's always been. Um, that's especially true, of course, for Chinese investments in the uh, ex-colonial world. As social democrat Europe, and maybe that's unfair to call them that, but compared to the US, uh, robs its poorer neighbors, it will continue to build walls to keep those neighbors out. The cost of the EU's border force, Frontex, is now half a billion dollars a year. So it could be argued that housing is the most bifurcated reality for workers, with huge disparities in outcomes, depending on whether you're a renter or a so-called homeowner. The pandemic initially stunned housing prices, but over the summer, the real estate uh, bubbles rebounded. There has been an enormous downward deflationary pressure on rents. Some 700,000 foreign-born immigrants have left London this past year, it's quite stunning, adding downward rent pressure there. In most OECD countries, renters account for 30 or 40% of residents. Germany is the exception where a majority of workers are renters. Neoliberal pro-ownership policies, of course, have promoted home buying with new jobs primarily precarious and low paid. Home ownership is not an option for most uh, uh, people under 40. Within homeowners, of course, there's also a polarization at the top. In the US, one in four homes were sold that were sold in the first half of 2020 were for over a half a million dollars. In the US since 2010, the number of renters has increased at double the pace of homeowners increases. There has been a decline in the number of people that are homeowners in every age group in the US uh, and largest for the under 44 year olds. The real estate bubble in most rich countries has most often meant escalating rents for those uh, workers living, especially in urban areas. Today, uh, as a result of the pandemic, some 8 million Americans, Americans are behind in their rent payments. I think the figure was for, um, uh, on average, over $5,000. <clears> so who is working and who isn't? In the US, in June, roughly 20%, 26% of workers were essential workers that were uh, working outside the home. Of the remaining 74% of workers, 42% were white collar workers who were working at home and uh, uh, roughly 33% were not working at all. Many essential workers won initial hazard pay that um, was then withdrawn by the bosses with the falling cases. Um, within this process, we also had 32% of those not unemployed had a pay cut or cut in hours. <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is look at the numbers and all the different complexities within those numbers. Which means, of course, that only a small number of workers were generally better off by the, uh, pan through the pandemic, but there were some. Workers aged between 50 and 54 had a general increased level of discretionary, discretionary spending during the pandemic. And the rate of savings, as most of us are aware, in the US also increased by fivefold during 2020. 
There was a reduction in credit card debt for workers if, they were, if you still had a job. Those owning their own home may have seen an increase also in, uh, in, on paper at least in their wealth. And despite a small uptick in home foreclosures, homeowners widely fared better than renters. However, with Bill Gates arguing that 30% of office days can be eradicated, we will see increased downward pay pressure on even these best paid workers. The hardest hit were those especially oppressed workers and young workers and those without a college degree. In the OECD countries, many service sector jobs are populated by immigrants. Mass unemployment in hospitality has resulted in some workers returning to their home countries, particularly in Eastern Europe. Despite eviction moratoriums, workers who are renters are likely to have ended 2020 with no savings and dramatically higher credit card debt. After the 2008 recession, it took capitalism about five years to recover the jobs lost, with average pay, of course, dramatically lower than it was previously. For this economic crisis, the scale of the debt, the scale of precarious work and unemployment will be far deeper and greater. Now, if you were one of the many categories of oppressed, of especially oppressed um, uh, workers under capitalism, then your economic status was likely to have been seriously damaged under the pandemic. And I wanna deal a bit here with the plight of one especially oppressed group in capitalism, the especially oppressed majority, women. So we've seen a substantial widening of the gap between the economic prospects of male and female workers. According to the ILO, 40% of all women workers are in restaurant, hotel and retail work. And some 70% of workers in health and social care are also women. So let's out, have a look at how US women uh, fared economically in the, in the pandemic. While men had a, a small net gain in the numbers of, uh, number of jobs in December, women had a 156,000 uh, job, uh, a net loss of jobs, accounting for actually 100% of all jobs lost. In August and September, almost a million workers gave up looking for work. 80% of those workers were women, uh, mostly aged between 35 and 44, most likely with school aged kids. Closed schools, of course, have forced many women back into their past roles of primary caregiving, uh, um, undoing decades of progress. For women, the lockdowns and increased isolation not only increase their poverty, but also their likelihood to experience domestic violence. The UN estimates that a stunning 87,000 women were intentionally, intentionally killed by their partners last year. So I want to touch a little bit just in the um, 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 conclusion about um, perspectives, just really in an outline. So folded into the economic fabric of the current era are the record levels of debt for all major uh, economies of the world. The question of inflation uh, as opposed to deflation is not the most likely scenario. However, the huge pandemic bottlenecks in production and distribution can lead to specific upward price pressures. The massive stimulus plans still, um, or rather for the ex-colonial world, the rapid explosion of inflation is inevitable. In Iran, prices are currently rising at about 50% per annum and Sudan at 200% per annum. The massive stimulus plans still fall short of making up for lost wages and therefore will not tend to increase inflationary pressures. US Federal Reserve is spending, um, is buying rather about $120 billion of debt per month. This is the monetary policy that has kept the markets booming uh, as, as mad as it is. Now, Rwanda cannot do this and India cannot do this. It all rests on the prestige and economic dominance of US imperialism. Record levels of debt are possible while interest rates and inflation rates are close to zero. However, as one economist in the Financial Times put it, it's like a Jenga tower of credit. I'm assuming everybody knows what Jenga is, but 
one element misaligns and then the whole thing can crash. This is one scenario that is not ruled out in 2021. If Biden's uh, proposed stimulus of $1.9 trillion passes Congress, it will be another shot in the arm of the unwell US economy, but it will not change the K-shaped framework of, uh, uh, of a future recovery. The EU stimulus is more infrastructure centered, whereas the US stimulus so far has not been. So how can a K-shaped economy or recovery be averted even under capitalism? If there was massive investment for a greening of all infrastructure, where millions of jobs would be created, that would in turn create millions more. Such a Keynesian direction is probable in some relative form in the period ahead. In February, Biden is expected to propose a multi-trillion dollar green infrastructure bill, unless he gets coal feet. This could have an impact on temporarily narrowing the scissors of a K-shaped recovery, meaning it might create significant amount of decent paying jobs. However, at some point, US workers and US imperialism's rivals will be forced to pay the price of such massive uh, spending. New jobs are more likely to continue to be precarious with dramatically lower pay. The aberration of the post-war period in the advanced capitalist countries, of course, is long gone. A return um, to a far more wealth polarized capitalism has been developing and deepening for decades. However, given the extreme severity of the current crisis, the ruling class will attempt to borrow against the future to buy it time. Comrades, we live in a world where landlords create homelessness, where bosses create unemployment, and where bankers rob people. The future presents two specters. One specter is that of right populism and the eventual return of dictatorships to replace bourgeois democracy. This is a very unstable solution for imperialism, given the enormous weight of the working class in society. The other aspect, of course, is the specter of communism, the specter of revolutionary socialism. The path to socialism will be cleared by the working class through building its own revolutionary party, and that, comrades, is our challenge.